I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik. Thanks for tuning in on this episode. Co-hosting to my left, president of the company, Steve Hornady. Across the table, we have engineering director, Mitch Middlestead, and former senior ballistic scientist and all-around ballistic guru, Dave Emery. Guys, thanks for joining me today. Happy to, to be here, Seth. Good to be here. Yeah. So uh, we've talked about this uh, in several other podcasts in smaller forms, in smaller chunks, but uh, uh, a little cartridge that uh, became grossly popular, just incredibly popular, the 17 HMR and its little brother, the 17 Mach 2. It really changed the scape of rim fire as a whole. The levels of velocity and accuracy were just unheard of uh, with off-the-shelf rifles uh, in, in, a, in a small little cartridge that could. And I've shot a lot of things, uh, coyotes included, uh, and, and prairie dogs with this little sucker. And I just enjoyed what it is. Well, that, that started here at Hornady years ago. The Dave kind of uh, taken the lead on that. And I'd like to discuss the development and the history of the 17 HMR and the 17 Mach 2. So how far do we have to re- rewind the clocks to get in front of the development of the 17 HMR? When did that really start, if that was the first one that was developed? 1999. For us. Yeah. It, it had been around. Okay. The 17 it, Rimfire. Jam- Rick Jameson and somebody from... Sh- else from shooting times in federal who messed around with it in the early 90s i think yeah mike bassard uh from federal called me back in the early 90s and said would you make us a 17 caliber bullet of some kind i don't remember probably was a hollow point at the time because we weren't doing tips and um would you make us this bullet like yeah sure okay and sent it up there and then and then nothing came of it from from that perspective so but that was I think fairly typical in a bigger company like that, you ended up with a group of people who did the analysis and said, nope, doesn't work. And moving on. From mm-hmm. from the, the studying I did at the time when, when we started messing around with it, they didn't have, you know, they had old school propellants back then. They didn't really get quite to the performance they wanted to and i think they always they were running it at pretty high pressures to get what they wanted to get out of it and they always had problems with blowing heads and they just cut and ran yeah but it well but it comes back again dave because you pursued it you you didn't give up and move on you know and and yeah. again i think in a bigger company like that of course i didn't know what the hell was going on you sons of bitches are playing around with shit that i don't know about <laughs> that's the part i want to get to <laughs> yeah and it, and there's all kinds of development crap going on that i find out about after the fact and then everybody gets yelled at for a day or two and then you move on yeah. but but because you chased it you didn't give up and you kept playing with the different propellants and stuff it didn't hurt that you had a bullet plant up there that could make something for you that you wanted but you didn't give up and that's the big difference yeah Yeah. made it happen yep it was uh it it started as as a personal thing with me and so how did that start well um my dad was getting pretty old at that point in time and he'd always had a 22 250 that he used to shoot woodchucks and crows and at that point in time, he was getting old enough, he didn't want to shoot that thing anymore. And his big interest at that time was he had bird feeders all over the yard, loved his birds, and he said, I doggone squirrels getting in my bird feeders, and this twenty two won't kill them, and on and on. Okay. So for a Christmas present, I decided, all right, I'm going to build him a, you know, a really, really good shooting twenty two Magnum. And I did that and sent it home to him, and he really liked the gun. And in the process of messing around with that, you know, I just got, I was a, honestly a a little bit bored and maybe unchallenged at the time and i out of this i that's when i kind of taught myself how to rudimentarily use Mm -hmm. uh cad to start doing uh chamber and and cartridge drawings which my understanding of cad was pretty simplistic but it was enough to work and you know gosh what happens if you neck this thing down to 17 this would really be a cool looking little cartridge and hey hornady makes a 17 crane bullet and 
as I recall, I had a three quarters of a box of 17, 25 hollow points sitting there. And I said, that's probably too, too heavy, but I used those to start with. And I just made a very, took a reloading die, blank reloading die. Mm -hmm. I think I had Alan Tonnage's polish a um, standard reamer to the 25 degree shoulder and, and made myself a form die. And started forming some cases and just started messing around and pretty quickly decided, ah, you know, 2400, 2350 out of a 25 grain bullet is not very interesting. And so I started parting off these 25 grain bullets, the 17 grain bullets, and, you know, like, oh, you know, 2500, 2550, that's getting a lot more interesting. Yeah. And just started messing around. And quite honestly, Steve, at the time, I was doing it on weekends and lunch breaks. <laughs> I, I wasn't oh, taking yeah. your company time to do <laughs> it. You, you, you can't get fired now, Dave. So I know. I know. <laughs> I know. Um, and I had a 22 that I got from my grandfather, actually my grandmother, after my grandfather shot a hole in the roof and she took it away from him. And it was an old Sears ugly thing made by Mossberg or Marlin or somebody. I don't know what it was. But I used that as the uh, receiver and got and restocked it and went through Kevin's, you know, shot out barrel, barrels, 55 gallon barrel drum. And here was an old shot out 17 and stuck the star or the bore scope in it and it had about, you know, three inches of free bore. <laughs> okay, what the heck? I cut it off at 21 inches and I think I went to Pacific Precision and had them make a reamer that I wanted and put a gun together. It's like, man, this thing really shoots i mean i was always frustrated with 22 magnum because they just they never shot what i would consider accurate and this thing i was shooting groups under an inch at 100 yards it's like man this is great and then i think it was a lunch i was partnering around making up a few more bullets to sh shoot and steve came down and what are you doing well i'm just kind of messing around with this project of my own here and he said do i know about this well no <laughs> why don't i know about this well <laughs> mm -hmm. i'm doing this all on my own time steve and that is, you know it progressed from there where he just you know made his off to come well i don't want you messing with i don't know this anymore you're fired and it's like okay <laughs> and yeah right like yeah. i've ever fired anybody no he, and i i knew that it was <laughs> it was his surprise of doing having something in his ballistics lab that he didn't know about and mm -hmm. it's like okay fair enough i i understand that and I, I, how long was it steve it was probably three or four months i kept kind of bantering with you with this thing and hey, you know steve this is you really ought to look at this and you're like ah, oh, we're not rimfire dave and well there were it, it, well it was a whole combination thing we're not rimfire there's nobody we can't make it nobody's going to make it for us and if you have to do it you have to go to a competitor to have it done and there's a, the logistics of yeah actually bringing the hmr to market were technically insurmountable but the advantage that we had at the time was the guy that was running cci and i'm trying daryl inman right no i think daryl i think daryl had left but hadn't been gone that long Maybe it was Daryl. I don't, you know what? I, I, don't th I thought it now. was like the last year Daryl worked. Well, yeah. Okay. I'll give you that one. And uh, they were willing to do it without telling their bosses, Well, it, <laughs> which, yeah. which was the only reason that it, that it was yeah. able to pull it off. And, I, literally. and, and there's more to that story. It, Steve might right. probably so, remember this too. So but, who made the first telephone call out there? Was it come from Steve or did it come from you? He he had sowed the ground. I had okay. talked to Brett Olin Brett about, Olin, okay. do you guys suppose you could do this? And well, if somebody gave me a good enough reason to do it, we could mess around with it. But And then I he's had, the same kind of guy as you are. Brett Olin and you are a very similar mindset. You yep. like guns. You like to mess with stuff. You like to tinker. Brett Olin tinkers with everything. Yep. And I still does. Yep. And, I, I, and I uh, talk to him every so often still, and he's retired as well. Yep. But he loves to tinker, loves to mess with stuff. You know, b b b b bullets and powder run through his veins just like you. Yep. You can have access to the Hornady Handbook of Cartridge Reloading at your fingertips wherever you are with the Hornady Reloading Guide app available for iPhone and Android. 
check it out today. But there's more to that story of getting Steve on board with this because oh, it boy. it was he just kept this isn't our bailiwick, Dave. We we can't yeah. get into this. So I, as one last desperation, was unwilling to give up on it, and I knew the guy and had been talking to the guy that wrote that did Small Caliber News. Remember that? It was no a, clue. It, it, okay, Small Caliber News. It was a quarterly magazine a guy did out of Ohio, and I decided, okay. I'm going to write an article on this and get it published in that, but I'm going to do it under an alias. So I wrote this article and pictures of my gun and pictures of the cartridges I made and all the performance I was getting and everything else in it. And, and he published it and you got the magazine at times. It was always sitting on your desk. And that's why I decided to do this. And that magazine came out and I waited about a day because I knew you had it on your desk and you came down the hall <laughs> And it was so hard for me to keep a straight face because I wrote it under the pseudonym Paul Davis. I lived in St. Paul, Nebraska on Davis Street. And you came He's down. Very original. Hall, yeah. And, <laughs> and you came down the hall and you said, Dave, have you seen this article? And I said, what article is that, Steve? Well, this guy by the name of Paul Davis wrote this article about all of this stuff with this 17 room fire you've been telling me about. This is really interesting. And. I'm thinking, oh, come on, he's just pulling my leg. And I let that go on for about a week. And then I remember walking into your office and saying, Steve, do you, do you know who Paul Davis is? Well, no, it's some guy by the name of Paul Davis. And I said, do you know who wrote that article? Well, this guy named Paul Davis. I said, do you know who Paul Davis is? No. I said, that's me. What do you mean it's you? And I said, I live in St. Paul, Nebraska on Davis Street. And, and that was when you, as I recall, finally said, yeah, maybe we ought to do this. Let me talk to somebody out at CCI. And when they and then they jumped at it, and you were okay. Let's let's do this. Uh, we have different memories. Okay. Yep. Let's hear the <laughs> which other. Which is okay. <laughs> yep. And I don't I don't remember the article, and I I don't remember that part of it. But what I do remember is you came in and you said, "This is really cool," and I'm going. There's no way that we're going to be able to do this cartridge. There's no way. Can't be done. Well, I've already talked to see people CCI, but you need to come shoot it. You need to come down and shoot it. You need to come down and shoot it. I got it downstairs. Come down and shoot it. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you pull the trigger the first time and went, oh, I mean, this is really cool. Yeah. The no recoil. Oh, first shot. It was like, oh, man. <laughs> He was right. <laughs> now, see, oh, yeah, that's a recollection is, I don't have, but yeah, I oh, do. Oh, that was, I mean, it was, there was no question. This is, this is great. I mean, this is, because it was going to be all about fun. There was zero recoil, but super fast trajectory, flat. I mean, compared to every other rimfire cartridge you've ever fired in your life, it was dramatically better. And it's about fun. You know, oh, fun. and it was like, you know, it was a couple of shots and it's like, okay, all right, all right, all right, I'll, we'll call CCI. Mm -hmm. And basically what they said was, well, yeah, we'll do it, but we need, you know, a minimum order. So, okay, what do you want? And I've, I recall, and I may not recall correctly, they wanted 5 million and we said, okay, we'll do 5 million. Yeah. And I, I remember I thought it, it was either four or five. I can't remember. It, it was, yeah, it was something on that order. Mm -hmm. And I remember you and I had a conversation one time where you asked me, so how many rounds of this do you think we'll sell this year? And, he, yeah. and, and, and you said, I ordered 5 million rounds. And I said, I think that's off by at least an order of magnitude. And you were like, mm, yeah, we'll see. And then when the real numbers came in, it's like, holy cow. Well, once, once you got a couple guns out there yep. and a couple of shots, and people started shooting it. It just Hooked. exploded. And American Rifleman put that yep that cartridge on the cover and white yeah. white cover with this little cartridge in the middle and said mm -hmm. actual size yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and that was two thousand two two thousand one sure, I think whatever, it, I think yeah. it was one two thousand one and it's two decades ago right. I'm not yeah. gonna remember so that. Yeah. previous <laughs> to that though how many covers of American Rifleman had already been featured on probably not too many I don't know that we ever mm. had had we oh we'd had product on there along with everybody else, but nothing like that. One. Nothing like the that. The white cover. So you get... Kind of like the Beatles white album. <laughs> this was the white cover. So yeah. you, get, you get the the initial order. 
how did you get gun builders on board? I mean, it seems pretty, okay, you have a 22 Magnum. This is just a, a barrel swap. But how did you get that initial, uh, you know, Mossberg, well, Sav- we had, Marlin Savage? We had really good relationships at the time with Ruger and Marlin. And I can remember having a lot of conversations with Harold Waterman. And I can't remember the guy I was talking to. It I can picture him, but I cannot remember the name of the fellow at Ruger. But, you know, it didn't take long to convince them to do it because, like Steve, they saw the value in this. And, and it's it, new guns. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's, right. it's gun sales. And it was virtually a transparent to them. It's like, take your existing platform and put a 17 caliber barrel on it. Yeah. it you don't have to change anything else. Magazines, nothing. I mean, it's just yeah. go. That's, yeah, it's the easy button. And like I've heard you say many times, Steve, we sell fun. It's fun. Yeah. And uh, with no recoil and a flat trajectory, and I've mentioned this before in some other places and on this podcast, young Seth bought a $160 Marlin heavy barrel at Walmart mm-hmm. and some 17 grain Hornady VMAX, and it shot under an inch with you know the Tasco 3 to 9 that came on there. Out of the box. Out yeah. of the box. Yeah. It just shot yeah. amazing. And prairie dogs and yeah, foxes, even coyotes. It, it's it's just fun. Yeah. And the we volume took, is there. We took some riders and some customers on coyote hunts. You know, shooting coyotes with a with a rimfire, that tiny rimfire was uh was really something. And I we took some customers up north here to shoot prairie dogs on here in Nebraska and I remember clearly shooting one prairie dog that clutched his chest and fell yeah. over <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I could, but you could uh, see it in the scope right you right. know when you pulled the trigger everything was still there right and in oh. the range at least for me uh oh, yeah. the range is really impressive compared to other rim fires oh yeah um i've shot prey dogs at uh i think my farthest is probably i think 294 yards comes to mind with a 17 hmr oh, that's, and wow that's a stretch that's that. that's a stretch but inside mm-hmm. of 200 yards it's, it's, it's easy a non-issue. Yeah. You yep. could yeah. hit them easily. Yep. Yep. And uh, the farthest shot with a pistol, uh, last year on a, on a media event I was on, we have a 8-inch Smith & Wesson Performance Center revolver with a fixed four-power scope. 183 yards with a revolver and 17 HMR. Wow. <laughs> and uh, you talked about that prey dog that clutched his chest. Muzzle velocity with that one is, I think, 1,700 out of the revolver. And... It, you could hear it like a, a thud hit the prairie dog, and it just like slowly fell over. <laughs> but uh, but the accuracy and the consistency was there, which mm. is pretty remarkable. So you make that first commitment of five million rounds, uh, and it's sold way more than that, probably in pretty short order, if the gun companies were initially excited. Yeah, I don't, you know what, it's been long enough ago. I don't remember the progression mm-hmm. of events there. We ordered that. We talked to the gun companies. We got some of them on board, um, and and that started coming out. And a couple of them get it, and then the word spreads, and then it it goes. And, yeah. And like I said, it was so easy for a gun company because you got a you've already got a, a Magnum rimfire rifle. You just put it on a, a different barrel, and you're in business. And again, it's new guns. Yeah. I'm not new getting sales. rid of my old twenty two. <laughs> I'm buying another gun. So it's new gun sales are always attractive right. to gun companies. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of conversations with them about, you know, to get the performance this guns, this cartridge capable of, you, you got to be mm-hmm. tight on your boring groove and you got to keep that throat tight. And Marlin was particularly good about that. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I don't, I don't think I ever shot a Marlin rifle no. that wouldn't shoot under an inch. Yeah. It just The uh, one thing that sticks in my mind from that time frame is we had, we put together an imp- employee purchase plan to buy to buy Ruger and Marlin rifles and at that time we only had about 150 people in the whole company and we placed an order for like 50 rifles so basically one third of the company bought a 17 HMR at the time wow yeah and so the one I bought was that heavy barreled um, Marlin 17 VS and yeah we shot 10 shot groups under an inch out of the box amazing Find the latest shirts, hats, hoodies, and accessories that you see here on the podcast and much more at HornadyGear.com. Yeah, for an economical rifle with economical ammunition, um, you can't ask any more than that, especially on a rimfire like you'd mentioned, Steve, when you're, it seems odd to be taking a, a customer to shoot a coyote. 
with a rim fire. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you know, range limitations apply, but uh, so capable, so fun. Um, Dave, when you, you mentioned you, you know, taught yourself how to work in CAD a little bit uh, on the engineering side, what did you guys learn about chamber design uh, through the process that obviously, you know, we've come out with many cartridges since then that Dave worked on a lot of them uh, about those tolerances. And what did you learn initially that helped with the subsequent cartridges that we developed? Well, just prior to that, I mean, I was a service rifle match shooter and I'd experimented with 308 chambers with tightening up the throat. And, you know, 308, I forget what it has, a thou and a big half throat, or yeah. two thou clearance it's, in it's the throat. It's oversized. Yeah. And I'd taken the military M852 reamer and tightened up that throat to half a thousandths clearance. And holy cow, man, it just really... I mean, we took a couple of factory rifles, you know, set the barrel back half an inch and rechambered it. And they went from, you know, minute and a quarter, minute and a half rifles to three quarter minute rifles. And so this was on a 17 HMR, you know, we designed it with a half thou clearance maximum in, in the throat and told all the gun manufacturers, the way you get this accuracy is you got to keep that throat tight. And that was where we really kind of got on the kick mm -hmm. of, if you want an accurate chamber, you got to keep some kind of a tolerance that's pretty tight on the throat you know we're not making a military gun here that's got to handle sand and dirt right. and all that kind of stuff tighten up the throats and you're going to improve the accuracy of it and that's where i think it first started and then it carried through everything right. we did after that and then didn't you put some freebore yep. in there as well you're right i forgot i put because hundred thousand freebore in it there was about hundred thousand freebore and that was, was something that wasn't done at the time really it, and, it, it gave uh, it everybody it more velocity. Yeah, everybody else, the conventional throat design was to come out of the chamber case mouth and go right into a one and a half a degree angle into the rifling. So there was no jump per se. There was no freebore at all. And everything, so the HMR started that for us. And every cartridge since then has about a hundred to one hundred twenty-five thousandths of freeboard, depending on which one it is. Mm -hmm. And that's been, I think, that's one of the components to accuracy. I just think I, it is. I agree. As long as you keep the throat tight, because I found that out when I was messing around to three hundred eight. I wanted to be able to shoot factory ammo, but out of this real tight throat. So I think that reamer that I read worked. I gave it one hundred and fifty thousandths freeboard, and I could then go with this extremely tight throat go shoot factory ammo and I didn't get excessive pressure. And that's mm -hmm. carried over into what I did with the HMR. And then that led to everything we've right. done since then. Right. Because I can, I can remember when we did that one and there was a few other cartridges in, in that time frame when we took that throat and design and we introduced those cartridges to <laughs> Amy, we got a lot of questions. Yeah, like, we got a lot Why did of... you do that? Why are you doing that? You can't do that. That's going to, you know, yeah, all we, the things. Yep. And I remember that too. We got a lot of cross-eyed looks from people. You can't make a throat that tight. Well, why not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they couldn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, they do now. Yeah. Yep. That's impressive. And Go they ahead, didn't, Steve. well, they, they didn't because from a manufacturability standpoint, it was easier to have a lot more tolerance. Oh, absolutely. Sure. And just oh, yeah. Yeah, put them out there. And the standards within the industry, as far as accuracy was concerned, were two inches. You know, that was good enough. Well, good enough was never good enough for our, that's not where we came from. Right. We always came from precision and accuracy, and we still do. So you, you can't live with that, and we weren't willing to live with that. Yeah. And the, well, it definitely changed the whole landscape because now, I mean, minute of angle is, is the, the, the worst that most gun builders are expecting uh and with factory ammo as well which is mm -hmm. you know i grew up in that era everything's been submitted of angle since i've been a shooter uh you know a lot of gun companies will guarantee it and uh i can't imagine buying a a rifle and knowing that the bullets are capable of incredible accuracy and the ammo is the best ammo on the market and not being able to get that performance because the rifle doesn't shoot that well uh, right. That would be frustrating as a as a consumer. But I, I mean, I don't know how you two see it, but I I viewed the 17 HMR as kind of an inflection point for the company. That I mean, we were known at that point and we were respected, but we were considered you know kind of back in the backwaters. Right. And that 17 HMR got us a lot of visibility and a lot of penetration into mm -hmm. magazines and markets. And you know, the company from there went you know. Like yeah, because it was just one after another, after another, after another. But the 17 HMR, as I saw it, really kind of opened the door to that. 
I I agree with that. I think it it was the first one where people just went, wait a minute, this is really big deal. What's going on? Because we'd on had the some. Yeah. Well, we'd had some others. I mean, we had the three seventy six tire, which sold twelve. Yeah, and the, um, the, we had the four fifty Marlin, which had some, and we did the four eighty Ruger, which I thought was a really cool cartridge, it was but a good it, it was cartridge. just never promoted right. by Ruger. Yeah, they you need you need your your gun company partner to get behind you on some of those yep. things. And, and for a lot of them, not picking on anyone, but for a lot of them, it's, if it doesn't turn into an, at least a two base hit, they, they move on, you know, sure. go back to my 243, 270, 30 out six, 308, They're in that romantic. category and, and live with those guys. So, <laughs> yeah. um, that one was the beginning. And then some of the others that have, come since then have changed that perception pretty dramatically yeah so well i think it's it's pretty well established the 17 hmr is here to stay i looked up the the stats here a couple of years ago we celebrated the 20th anniversary of the 17 hmr and uh, had a media event that we took some some writers out on <laughs> and i looked up bullet production of the 17 grain v max just the bullet production and uh it was staggering on, on the amount of projectiles that we've made, uh, a, a, almost a made up number. When you look at the, 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 the difference between a million and a billion is light years. And we have, we have made a ton of, of bullets that go into 17 HMR ammunition for the various manufacturers. Well, now that you say that, and you'd probably have more memory of this than me and you would too, Steve, it pushed us very hard in our how we made bullets and mm -hmm. developing better techniques and faster right. techniques for making bullets. No question. Right. The Hornady Security Fireproof Keypad Safe. With a heavy duty 16 gauge steel body, extra thick eight gauge steel door, and four one inch diameter locking lugs, the Fireproof Safe achieves a fire rating of 30 minutes for up to 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. Both the interior and adjustable shelf are covered in a protective carpet that offers flexible storage configurations while safeguarding valuables from damage. The Fireproof Keypad Safe from Hornady Security. So, before we shift gears into 17 Mach 2, is there anything regarding the 17 HMR that we, we glossed over or missed or that you're now recollecting? I don't know. The, um, well, so after the first 5 million and they went out the door, it was like, uh, we need more. <laughs> okay, more. well, that doesn't, you know, doesn't fit our schedule. We, you know, that was going to be the struggle then because now you're, you're changing what they're doing at CCI from long rifles and magnums and you're putting this one into the mix and it hadn't been in the mix it was fine to run that batch but now you're starting to talk about other stuff and now they want it sure they do and there are some others that want it yeah. their parent company federal wants it yeah. and so now it was like okay how are we going to do this part and so there was quite a lot of negotiation that went on there but it was easy to do one-on-one -on -one, mm -hmm. and we got it done and that that agreement has held for basically twenty years, right? And that that like you said, it changed what CCI had to do for production mm -hmm. and federal, and we had to make more bullets. Like mm -hmm. you talked about getting the speed, we had to make mm -hmm. bullets for those companies as well. I do remember one anecdote in there though that some guy wrote in like I've been shooting all these different seventeen HMRs, and you shoot the best of all of them. The CCIs and the Federals don't shoot at all. Really? Okay, yeah, fine. They're all made in the same factory. <laughs> yeah, same, same components. Bullet. We make the same bullet. It's, yeah. you know, it's like. Mm. I, remember, I remember you saying something about that one. Yeah, that, that was, <clears throat> that was funny. I thought so. The uh, one thing, though, that I think helped on the HMR, put it over the top. Oh, and back when then Dave first started working on it, well, and when, uh, when, Hedrill first started working on it. They didn't have the OBP 516, no. and that yep. was one of the main components that really shines in the H in the HMR. Okay, so just um, propellant it's, technology it's, yeah. changed. It's what got the performance that we got. And when Federal was messing with it in the early 90s, I mean, they were running at high enough pressures that they had unreliable rims. I mean, they were blowing rims, and they were struggling to try to get you know 2350. They couldn't even get 2350 with the powders that are available. And, yeah, okay, this is not really enough over a 22 Magnum that this is very interesting or marketable. Mm -hmm. 
So that, that but, propellant technology yeah. change, and now you're getting 200 <clears throat> feet per second faster than that at lower pressure. Yeah, yeah. You now start pushing 2600, and you sit there and say, "Hey, this thing shoot right with yep. a 22 Hornet," and now all of a sudden, guys are like, "Really?" Mm -hmm. yeah, that sells. Yeah, speed sells. Oh yeah. So the the biggest question that's left unanswered: Did your dad shoot the squirrels? Did he get the squirrels out oh, of his bird gosh. feeders? I can tell you stories about that because he he had the 22 <laughs> Magnum for uh, about a year. And then that original gun that I built, I was going to give to my brother, but he got killed in an accident. So oh, I gave it to my dad. That. Uh, that was a long time ago. Yeah. But I gave it to my dad and I can remember calling me, man, this gun is just awesome. All I got to see is the top of their head and they're dead. <laughs> <laughs> and, then he, and then he called me up one night and he said, Dave, I got in trouble tonight. There was a raccoon on the deck. And I had to go out and hose the deck off. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, your mom didn't like that at all. Oh, <laughs> but he, he loved that rifle. And he, you know, he was like the urban snipers. They lived out in the country. Yeah. But, you know, he he was funny watching. <laughs> oh, there's a squirrel on my head. He'd run down the end of the mudroom and crank the window open a little bit. And you'd watch him put that gun out there and pop and whop. You know, and down comes the squirrel. And he, he loved that thing. Yeah, there's an ad about the squirrels are back. It's personal now. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, mission accomplished. Yep. Uh, so from the 17 HMR, what spawned the, the little brother, the 17 Mach 2? Um, well, a little shorter, a little slower, but still as accurate? It, it, yeah. It, it, it had all of the same attributes as the HMR, just a little less performance and slower. But everybody wanted to put the HMR in semi-autos, and it just didn't it doesn't work. It didn't yeah. work. It just, there was too much energy, too much dwell time, and the rims weren't strong enough, and you... Well, and they, they, nobody was really making very many semi-automatic in Magnums anyway. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, they own, weren't. You know, and because uh, even 22 Mag wasn't reliable in, in semi-autos. And everybody and their brother makes a 22 long rifle. Right. So, make it for the gun. Yeah. So, they, you know... The reason, the, the, the primary reason the Mach 2 came around was everybody wanted that kind of performance in a semi-auto. And it's like, you're just never going to get there with the case design on a, on a Magnum case. And so that was what spawned the Mach 2. And Marlin, was it the 717? Is that what it was called? They I built so. a purpose-built rifle for the 17 Mach 2. And that was a, I, I don't know why it didn't make it because i had one and it was accurate oh, and yes. it was a fun to shoot rifle mm -hmm. part of it was they didn't commit to picking it putting it in the market yeah they it was getting the commitment from them to make that capital investment at that time was just like pulling teeth ownership didn't want to invest that yeah. kind yep. of yep. capital and and mm -hmm. and i i worked them friends of mine at the time running a company i pushed them really hard to get it done and and we got it done but they just, they weren't behind it. Okay. And they needed to commit dollars and effort and marketing and everything. And they didn't. Yep. From but the, I, I still know. And then quit. I still know people that have got 717s and Marlin bolt actions and Mach 2. And they just absolutely love that little cartridge. Yep. Yeah. I, I've talked to people all over. It seems like they'll single somebody at Hornady out and go, I, I got a Mach 2 and we mm -hmm. need more ammunition. I've been shooting that thing since whenever. And yep. it's just. Amazing. From a design standpoint, uh, was it really straightforward after doing the 17 HMR? Was the Mach 2, you know, kind of more of the same on a smaller scale, or did it present some interesting let me, problems? Let me think about that. I flew over because we heard Ely was working on it, and I flew over to Ely and showed them what we were doing. So basically, to convince them, stand down, let us bring it out. You make that what we're doing. And and they agreed with it. And I think that they basically looked at, we just had, we were further along and we had a better chance to enter the marketplace. Sure. Um, but that, again, same problem. We were 100% confident this is going to flow. Everybody was, this is going to work through every semi-automatic that's ever existed. And it doesn't. Didn't quite. Well, mm, we, no. in order to try to get what we got out of it, we used the CCI Stinger case, which is, I think, 100 thousandths longer. Yeah, it's just a little longer. It, and it, we could fit the existing bullet o jive in it, and it allowed us to, to maximize the performance of that thing. But, you know, even the Mach 2, it's probably a lot more efficient than the HMR, because, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. 22 out of a 
2200 out of the same bullet with that small a case is, I mean, that's a pretty efficient little cartridge. Yeah. yeah. But that was the technical part of it. We based it off of this 22 Stinger CCI case in the same bullet. And uh, those it, actions it, it, just couldn't handle it. It really wasn't right. transparent. You know, again, it was, you know, instead of a grain and a half of powder in there, it was two and a half grains of powder. And I just got the same problem. The dwell time was just too long. I remember the 717 Marlet was a tungsten bolt. That was what yeah, they was had to go to to bolt. get it to work. Yep. And then a lot of people just weren't willing to put the investment go to, in that. Go to that to do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, compared to every 22 long rifle out there, those guns were dramatically going to be more expensive or they didn't work. Yeah. They just couldn't get them to work. And then there were a lot of people out there who were doing different things. There was, I saw an article by some guy down in, in Kansas who said, you don't need to buy. 17 Mach 2 ammo, you just buy 22 long rifle ammo and just shoot it through the Mach 2 and it'll switch Switch down. down. Oh yeah. Oh Oh, my gosh. Oh yeah. Oh no. There was, there were guys out there promoting that all the time that they Mm. knew that they could do it. Well, (sighs) yeah. Okay. But (laughs) that's, you're going to have an accident. I remember that now because you had me do a test in the lab. I remember doing that now and shooting a bunch of rounds to see if the case heads would fail. Yeah. And, uh. I don't remember how that it came out now, but it was pretty scary. It's like, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> beyond yeah. stupid for yeah, one right. thing. But yeah, that's strikes two and three right there. Yep. And to put that in print with your name on it would okay. seem pretty disingenuous. Yeah. Remarkable. And you talked about your, your dad being the urban sniper. I think of, uh, my dad, uh, little ground squirrels in central Nebraska and had a, a savage stainless heavy barrel in 17 Mach two. And it was, it was lethal, quiet, no yep. recoil, yep. Yeah, crack the window open, take them out and go back to work. Yep. <laughs> well, it, that cartridge uh, maybe never did get the love that it deserved, but it, it certainly has the performance. Uh, you know, it's fun to shoot. Yeah. And so this is something we've talked about internally over the years and we discuss it here. You know, do we think when we take a look back, I think we've talked about if, if we would have brought out the Mach 2 first. It would have been more popular at the start and then came in with the HMR. behind it with the HMR. Yeah, I couldn't disagree with that. Yeah, so You never one. would have made it. Oh, yeah? N- not because of what you're saying. You, it, The reason that you wouldn't have made it is if you'd have come out with a Mach 2, mm-hmm. those rimfire companies would have had that, would have had the HMR before we could have ever done anything oh. with it. They'd have stomped all over us and we couldn't have done anything about it. Right. They'd have just said... The same people that were loading the HMR were loading Mach 2 for us. So if we'd have started with Mach 2. Then they would have already went down that road. They and would, have, would, and they would have. They'd have the bullets. They'd go, we know what powder you're using. We can. And they'd have been there. Instead yeah. of it being called yeah, okay. the HMR, it'll be yeah. called the CCI. Yeah, FMR or something. something. Yeah. I don't know. No, you're probably right about that, Steve. Yeah, it's you just, probably are. You know, it's, it's just the accident of time and circumstances mm-hmm. and things coming together the way they do well i'm glad that it ended the way it did and started the way it did because uh, the 17 hmr has permanently changed rim fire performance expectations you can you can expect to buy factory ammo with an affordable economical rifle and it's it's going to shoot well and between prairie dogs up to coyotes and and just target shooting it's amazing to get you know my seven-year-old son shooting it or my wife, who's kind of an inexperienced shooter, there's no recoil. It's quiet, especially if you strap a suppressor onto that thing. It's just, it's fun in a box, and it's affordable to do so. And, and mm-hmm. that's, like Steve says all the time, we sell fun, and that is fun. It's fun to hit what you're aiming at, and you usually hit what you're aiming at with the 17 HMR. Yep. Good job. Yeah, thank you guys. Well, is there anything else that you guys that we might have glossed over between the Mach 2 and the HMR and the development? I don't think so. I think we pretty well covered it. Awesome. Yeah, I'm sick and tired of talking about it. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, on behalf of everybody who's enjoyed the 17 HMR, Steve, thanks for not firing Dave for working on that. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thanks for coming on the show. I sure appreciate there it. There were a lot of other things he didn't get fired for also. So. Oh, gosh. Is it 6.5 Creedmoor maybe, something like that? No, he didn't oh. get fired for that either. All right. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, guys. Everybody out there, hopefully you enjoyed this discussion on the 17 HMR and the 17 Mach 2. If you've got a comment, uh, hit us up, podcast at hornady.com, or drop a comment right here on YouTube. 
We appreciate it, and we'll catch you on the next one.